it's not about tech and how cool it is. It's about empowerment, you know, engagement. Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 61 of the Stroke Cast. A few weeks ago, I stopped by a Microsoft retail store to talk with the folks about the Xbox Adaptive Controller. The Xbox Adaptive Controller is an accessory that makes it possible for folks with disabilities to play the same video games as everyone else. Most people first encountered it during the Super Bowl ad in 2019 that Microsoft ran. You can actually see that commercial over at strokecast.com slash Eric. I shared some thoughts about it in a Facebook Live video and what I saw as a potential future for this product. An occupational therapist and U.S. Army veteran, Eric Johnson, reached out to me about some of the work he's been doing with this device. Eric joins us on the show today to talk about his story, what the occupational therapy field is all about, how his team was involved in the Xbox Adaptive Controller, and how video games are changing the future and even the present of therapy. This is a long episode, so let's get right into it, and let's meet Eric Johnson. So Eric, thank you so much for joining me here on StrokeCast this week. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to meet with you guys and chat and look forward to the conversation. Have you always wanted to be in the medical field? You know, it's an interesting question because um, when I was in high school, like didn't even cross my mind. Um, when I, uh, I ended up joining the army out of college after I didn't do very well. And I was an early childhood education major at the time. And after that failed attempt at college, I decided to enlist And one of the jobs they said was a veterinary technician, so I could work with animals in the military, uh, which was I thought was kind of cool. Do do they still Um, have a lot of animals in the military then? I mean, I know they were using horses back in World War One, but yeah, I mean, they still have all the bomb dogs, the drug dogs. They have, you know, all those things. So I mean, they deploy with us, you know, overseas, and and there's a lot of research that happens. So you know, we actually find ourselves working with a lot of, you know, monkeys and. Um, we have uh, horses and um, donkeys and, you know, believe it or not, there's a lot of stuff. We have a big uh, mission in the kind of uh, water world, too. So there's like a mm. dolphin center out in San Diego. And so the neat thing about the Army is that it's the only field that covers veterinary me- medicine for the entire military. You know, so if you were landed one of those gigs, you essentially covered the entire military service. So pretty cool stuff. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. So anyway, but I was, uh, yes, I was a vet tech for about uh, four years. Um, But in that um, time, I had actually, I was stationed over in Germany. I had gotten there, I don't know, and I only been there a few months. And we were gearing up to go to uh, Bosnia. And I was in this really horrific car accident where I was burned all, all over my body. So my legs, my arms, my face, my neck. And um, it was just really awful. And uh, I was medevac to the Army's burn center down in San Antonio. And it was there where I met my first occupational therapist. Um, and it was just a really kind of cool profession that I had saw right away that was very different than the other professions. They looked at things differently and um, they treated me differently and their mindset for recovery was very different than all the other kind of medical people. So that's kind of what started me in that medical world of thinking, hey, maybe I should do something medical. So what was different about their perspective? Well, it was always, you know, the focus was always like, well, how is this going to translate to home? You know, like where, you know, if you go into a hospital right now, it's very save your life, keep you alive. uh, Let's get up. You know, it was very what's right in front of you. Whereas OT would look at things like, for example, I couldn't play baseball because my hand was severely burned and I was worried about playing golf or baseball or whatever. And they're like, well, you know what, let's do a treatment plan where we're going to start working on getting that callus up and better, you know, or like getting, you know, your hands ready to be able to engage in those things that you used to love to do. Um, they were always looking at how does this translate home? 
Um, so as we were working on treatment, they were working very specifically on those goals that I had, um, what would help identify me as an individual um, when I went home. It wasn't just like this um, overarching, you're a burn victim. And this is what we do for burn victims. It was like, you're Eric Johnson. You had some injuries that prevent you from engaging in life. And how do I help translate that for you in a place where you will seek independence and be able to re regain those things um, in either compensation or recovery. Does that make sense? I want to interrupt with a short note here. In the next few minutes, Eric and I will be talking about working with and doing dissections of cadavers of both humans and dogs. If you are uncomfortable with that, you might want to fast forward two to three minutes. And now back to the episode. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. So then what was the transition like going from vet tech to OT? Yeah, it was it was really interesting because in OT school, there's, you know, there's a lot of anatomy, sciences, all that stuff. And I, you know, going from working with military working dogs, um, I actually ended up, when I was a vet tech, I did a lot of um, autopsies on dogs, well, they're called necropsies in the vet world um, or in the animal world. So I would, um, I had learned the the body so well. And even though the dog is different, there's a lot of similar things. And so, you know, tra transitioning to working with humans, I was like, oh, there's that thing. Oh, there's that thing. <laughs> I, I remember in, uh, being in gross anatomy lab and having to cut through a spinal cord. And I was like, oh, I got this. No problem. I do this all the time. You know, and it was so bizarre because <laughs> mm -hmm. it was a human spine instead of a, a dog spine. But, you know, or like taking the um, the skull. Uh, this is all morbid sounding, but the skull <laughs> off of, you know, um, our, our human uh, donor um, or, uh you know, uh, anything like that. So it was interesting in that aspect um, to kind of already understand the body and human anatomy or, you know, anatomy of a, a living thing. Uh, a, lo a lot of the physical techniques you would have to do sure. were essentially sure. the same. It was just tweaking the details. Right, right. Um, and then um, the cool thing was to be able to have this understand, like, you know, a dog can't tell you what's wrong with him. You know, they just have symptoms like you, like this dog is hobbling or this dog uh, has been throwing up. Um, but if I have a human, they can say, oh, I'm not feeling so well or, oh, I fell off the ladder and twisted my ankle or, you know, oh, I just snapped my, you know, I fell down and hit my wrist or something like I, I have something to go off of where, you know, in the vet world, it was all just kind of symptomatic. Like, oh, I don't know what is, you know, his kind of leg is flapping around. Something's not quite right. Mm -hmm. you know? So that was also very, it's a, it's a nice added addition. Until you get to some of the stroke survivors who then struggle with the communication challenges and then are not necessarily able to communicate what's wrong with Ooh, them yeah. either. Yeah. And that's a good, that's a really good point. Um, you know, if you have somebody that's aphasic or, you know, um, has some kind of cognitive, um, you know, deficit, you know, secondary to the stroke, that becomes a whole new um, ball of wax, you know, and you have to find clever ways to be able to communicate, um, which actually, I'll say, those are probably my favorite patients, um, to be able to kind of relearn words, relearn um, their kind of place in space and who they are and how they engage with other people. That's a, that's a really neat, cool, empowering place to be um, as you work with them. Awesome. So, I mean, one of the things that, um, you know, I was always just a marketing guy before I encountered this world and now know way more about neurology and neuroplasticity than any marketing guy should ever know. But <laughs> right. one of the things I was shocked and dismayed to discover is just how badly designed the, sh the human shoulder is to, you know, Ugh. when you've got things like subluxation where Ugh. when if you're not using the arm, the body just tries to get rid of the stupid thing. Um, yeah, doesn't want it anymore. <laughs> so, so after working with uh, with animal anatomy, are there any joints or structures you found in the dogs or in other animals that you kind of wish we had in humans? Oh, that's a cool question. Um, you know, uh, I will tell you that I'm very thankful that we don't have the same hips as dogs do. Um, there's a very common injury in, in animals that's called hip dysplasia. And, you know, a lot of your kind of bigger dogs like labs and stuff like that would have them, German shepherds and stuff. Uh, especially the purebreds. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, that's one great thing about you know, <laughs> not having that, that those issues with humans. Um, you know, uh, I, I will say that, you know, the human 
um, isn't designed to um, walk on all fours. And so the wrists are a little bit um, tough. And so if you have any kind of compromise in your wrist, um, all of a sudden your world gets a lot more challenging. Like uh, Just like a stroke sur um, survivor who's got a flaccid arm, uh, losing that arm or even partial part of it, um, not being able to use it compromises your life in a huge, huge way. So, you know, dogs have, you know, these four different, you know, hands, if you will, or four different legs. Um, but um, they're designed to take impact over and over and over again. Whereas humans, you know, we have so many injuries that if somebody falls and tries to catch themselves with the wrist, you know, and break a wrist or tear a ligament and all of a sudden you have, you know, months of therapy to go through in order to just get back to normal where you don't have the pain that's associated with it. So um, I guess in a sense, I would love to have seen, um, I don't know, maybe the human anatomy to be able to take a little bit more rigor, or, you know, uh, or, you know, impact with the upper extremities. That makes a lot yeah. of sense. So, I mean, your background in OT and in, uh, and in working with the military, I mean, how much work are you doing these days with stroke survivors? Well, you know, believe it or not, so since I've le left the military, um, that's been a couple years now, I actually started um, at a hospital here in Waco, Texas called Baylor Scott and White. And <laughs> I started I, in, in high school. I did a two week debate camp at Baylor University. Ah. Perfect, perfect. And of course, we just had our, you know, national champion Lady Bears uh, in basketball, you know, in case your <laughs> listeners need to be reminded. Um, but, um, but Baylor Scott and White here in Waco. Uh, and I, my first job out of the Army was working in a rehab uh, facility, which is heavy stroke, heavy neuro, heavy stroke. And what's funny is, you know, for me, I had been a, an OT for, I don't know, 10 years before I even started at that facility and you know i have young service members that were athletes you know like so if you had limb loss or spinal cord injury or brain injury they were still young athletes that you know prior to that so the recovery was very different um so now going into you know uh stroke rehab a neuro uh, rehab um, these are you know, patients that were anywhere from you know 40 to 90 years old with strokes and i had almost no experience with stroke. So I had to like relearn how, who I was and how to be a therapist to them. Um, and there were some challenges there, you know, I had to kind of relearn anatomy and relearn, um, you know, where, the, uh, where, a, you know, where a brain injury or, you know, what kind of brain injury would cause what to the, you know, side of the body or, or what kind of, what's an ischemic stroke, what's, so, you know, uh, you know, uh, ABI versus the TBI, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. So it, was, so it was very interesting and very different. So I, so to answer your question, I work with strokes almost every single day. Um, and, uh, and they're all so very different and so very fascinating. The human body is incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, 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 it really is. I think what's, what's really interesting when you start dealing with stroke, of course, is that, you know, I can look at it and I can say there's absolutely nothing wrong with my left arm. There's absolutely nothing wrong with my left leg. Everything, yeah. the entire problem, it is literally all in my head. Yeah, it's crazy. It makes no <laughs> sense. Yeah. So, yeah, plus I imagine not only are you dealing with folks a little bit later in life, the uh, when you're working, in the, working with folks in the military, you know, obviously you've got folks who are already into athletics, but – also folks who are pretty much at their peak physical condition yeah yeah and absolutely. then you start working What's, with civilians and it's very different yeah every once in a while we'll have a young stroke that comes through you know your 20s or 30s um and they are very different you know i'm um, like even working with them it's different than working with a 50 60 year old stroke um, because you know when you're older like aged isn't very forgiving you know we our bodies do break down and our bodies do have a lot of things that happen to them as they change, as we get older. Um, so a stroke just over compromises that, you know? Right. And so it's like, okay, well, I already had all these issues going on. So now I have diabetes stroke and osteoarthritis in the good leg that I have right now, hmm. you know? So, you know, now you're trying to figure out like, how do I live life with, uh, you know, uh, hemiparesis or something. But on top of that, the, all these other comorbidities, whereas if I had a 20, 30 year old, those don't really necessarily exist yet. Right. 
Right. So that's tough. Right. Plus, plus you've got to uh, also you've got to, you know, rethink things like your your PNF patterns when you've got to be more concerned about damaging the the bones that are in that compromised limb or damaging right. the joints that may right. already have other pain. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's a really good point. Um, and I don't think people think about that. They, I mean, people, you know, the overuse in the non-affected side of your body is tremendous. And people often forget about that and often, you know, don't uh, really take in consideration that your body your body is basically going to have to, um, you know, relearn everything and take all the load on everything on one side if we don't have spontaneous recovery and, and whatnot. So it's 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 troublesome. Right, right. So that, so I mean that's that's something I you know I never even thought about really and until I, I occasionally start to get uh my, you know my my right leg starts to complain but suddenly now you're taking um. You know, if you're left side hemiparesis and you're able to walk with a cane or a walker or something like that, suddenly now you've got this one good leg, which is uh, held 50% of your body weight for its entire life. And now it's got to take on 80 to 90% of that weight and that weight bearing to right. get you through. And it's it's not optimized for that. No, no. The body wasn't designed to, to do that. I'm so, I mean, so, you know, even just teaching about joint um, protection and whatnot is a huge part of leaving the facility or like your lifelong learning. And it's similar to people in wheelchairs. I mean, you know, the shoulders weren't designed to take the load of pushing uh, a chair for life, um, you know, so, you, you know, um, having good program to strengthen those kind of uh, inner muscles and, uh, and, you know, the overall shoulder is and valuable um, to being able to maintain them throughout your lifespan. So, I mean, one of the things that's been significant in what we've seen through our, you know, the military engagements the country's been involved in over the last 20 years or so is tremendously higher survival rates from battlefield injuries than we may have had, you know, 50 years ago, which has also meant we're now seeing more folks with, uh, living with traumatic brain injuries or, or TBIs. Right. So how do you, I mean, how do you compare the experiences you've had with folks with a TBI versus folks with an ABI or acquired brain injury like stroke? Sure. Um, and that's a great question. I mean, uh, the biggest thing, especially right away is that one is a pretty physical injury that happens. So you're, Traumatic brain injury is going to happen from a uh, some kind of event that was, uh, you know, for me it was usually blast injury, so an improvised explosive device, um, or maybe they were in a vehicle that was, um, you know, hit by a, a rocket propelled grenade. Um, or something like that. In the civilian world, you'd see like car accidents or, um, you'd see the sports related injuries like concussions and, um, you know, things like that. So those would be like a traumatic event versus your ABI, which would be like a stroke. So, so right away, initially, acutely, you would, you know, you'd already be dealing with a secondary comorbid thing. Um, so there's, good chances of other physical injuries happening. So not only you're dealing with the brain injury, you're dealing with um, other physical, you know, injuries. So maybe, so some of my guys that I would have in military would be, you know, triple amputees and the brain injury. So a lot of times they wouldn't even think about the brain injury all that much right away. They would just say, oh my gosh, this guy lost three legs. We got to, you know, say blah, 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 blah. And that would be your discussion. Um, and then all of a sudden you realize later, wait a minute, he had this really awful, you know, mild traumatic, moderate traumatic brain injury that we missed or, you know, or that we didn't properly manage. And so that, you know, so initially the acute management is very challenging. Um, whereas, you know, if you have a, a stroke, then, all, you know, you know right away, like, hey, the biggest issue right now is this. And so for me, like my, my first thought is save the shoulder. Um, I have to give the brain every opportunity to be able to recover. And then, um, you know, of course, this is assuming that we have like a flaccid le left or right side. Um, so we do a lot of work to maintain passive range of motion, but also that, that shoulder joint, you know, in general. Um, so, um, so as I'm looking at um, it, could, because when you're doing like an acquired brain injury, you know, it's like the brain was what, 
is the is the biggest thing that's the problem right now. It's, it's nothing else. Whereas a traumatic brain injury, injury, there could be several comorbidities that they're trying to manage on top of the brain injury. And so, um, so I don't know if that makes any sense, but you know, essentially, I feel like. Um, I can give a lot more attention to acquired brain injury because that's my sole focus as compared to if there was a lot of other things going on um, where it pulls and distracts me from kind of what I'm trying to get to. Yeah. So with, with, uh, with an ABI, you know, the brain injury is the number one priority to deal with from the beginning rather than right. in a TBI where, you know, you've got a lot of other things that um, – our, our, our higher priority. And, you know, that may seem weird to folks that the brain wouldn't be the highest priority. But, you know, with TBI, you've got other injuries that have not dealt with in the next 20 minutes results in the patient dying. And that's right, exactly. not the case with many uh, ABIs yeah. or strokes. Yeah. Yeah. When, when I was in Afghanistan, that was uh, a lot of times you would see that. So they would come in um, with multiple injuries and of course the physical injuries that you're seeing um, in front of you, unless it's like an open head wound, but the very physical injuries that you see in front of you often take kind of that precedence, like, okay, we've got to control the bleeding and this, that, and the other. And then all of a sudden the other things start to um, rear their ugly head, like, Oh, wait a minute, there might be a brain injury or there might be this, or, you know, I mean, obviously it'd be kind of naive to not be looking for that brain injury, but sure. Sometimes they don't. Right, right. Ab ab absolutely, absolutely. So longer term, what are you seeing? Are, are you seeing any differences in the way the brain is responding to folks, you know, six months out when you may be working with them in, in OT? Are, are, or, or do you typically see there's a lot more in common with the TDI and the AVI folks? Um. Well, you know, it's hard because I think it's very, you know, patient to patient, person mm -hmm. to person, you know, like I see some things like, you know, no matter how many strokes that you've seen and assume that you're going to, you know, this one's going to be just like the one that you just saw. It's never the case. And TBI is like, oh, this guy'll be fine. You know, he's, you know, or, or you know, he's recovering, you know, he'll recover just as much, you know, quickly and as fast and effectively as this person. But then all of a sudden you don't see that. And it's like, well, wait a minute, I thought something and that wasn't the case. You know, you'll do the, maybe the same treatment plan or assume the same type of stuff, but then all of a sudden don't get the same results. Um, and so, you know, I think that, um, you know, for me, I try to stay away from labeling people rather than labeling symptoms or or goals and so like mm -hmm. if, if i go into somebody it's not important to me um what type of injury they had yeah i mean to, to a point you know but it's important to me to say who are who's this person um and how do i what do i need to do to get them back to again their own independent and individual you know life. Um, and so understanding who they are will give me a, a huge um, jump ahead. So sometimes that's from the family, you know, sometimes the patient can't explore that with me. So I will have to get that from the family. But whether it's a, a TBI or ABI, um, I'm going to the approach is going to be very similar, um, because I'm looking at their long term um, um, life and how how my therapy will affect that. So um now, obviously, if it was a stroke, um, there are some very specific things that I have to manage in the meantime. You know, we're looking at, you know, uh, you know, dressing and toileting and, um, and, and, and being able to just get around transfers, things sure. like that. Um, whereas sometimes my brain injury on my TBI patients, sometimes they're, you know, up and about and moving around and everything's, you know, fine, but they're cognitively, um, have some huge deficits. So, you know, we have to look at them a little bit differently. So, um, you know, and, and again, I hate to even blanket those two types of situations because sure. sometimes I have a brain injury that looks like a stroke that, I mean, or a TBI that looks like an ABI and sometimes vice versa. So, so I don't really like to label either or, um, in the, in the way that I approach, um, my treatment plans and my goals. Fair. Does that make any sense? Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Ultimately, your priority is less how did we get here and more where do we go from here? Yeah, exactly. 
so the way way you and I first connected was, of course, uh, when I shared some thoughts about Microsoft's uh, Xbox uh, adaptive controller, which is a really cool thing to start uh, to start seeing and becoming more prominent. Uh, you know, a lot of folks learned about it first from the big Super Bowl ad back in January. But what yeah. role do you see video games playing in your practice? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's it's awesome. It's so much fun, and it's very different. Um, <laughs> non-traditional i guess you would say hmm. so yeah so so i mean what makes what makes gaming so important to your patients then yeah well okay so let's let's rewind a little bit sure so, absolutely you know, the funny thing about the adaptive controller like as we are working on this product um you know we've we identified uh, i started using gaming and therapy probably like 15 years ago and you know, in the, in those places, I knew that if I engage somebody in purposeful activity, which is a very, you know, um, uh, common term in the OT world, purposeful activity, that I could probably get more so, out of So what, what does that term mean? So purposeful activity essentially is when you engage somebody in an activity that means something to them. Um, so, for example, if I said... Bill, what I want you to do is I want you to stand at this table for as long as you can mm -hmm. because we're going to work on standing. Mm. And then you stand there and you're like, I'm, you know, I'm standing, but all I can focus on is the pain in my hip or whatever. And, and so you stand there for like two minutes. Actually, this is a good example sure. um, because um, I recently used the Xbox adaptive controller for a patient who was in a motorcycle accident. And he had pretty much shattered the right side of his body. Um, still all, you know, uh, intact, but he had pins and screws and things like that. And he, the doc had given him uh, permission to be able to put weight on it and stand on it. Um, so in this particular situation, the day before we said, hey, why don't you stand up at this table and build a puzzle? Well, he's not really a puzzle guy, but, you know, he did what we said, um, stood at the puzzle and it was... Um, stood there for about two minutes, um, n knew that this guy was a gamer. The next day I hooked up this, um, the Xbox adaptive controller to give him, um, a, a, a task to do standing again, but this time I'm engaging him in something that he's interested in, something that was functional and purposeful to him. And he went from day one doing two minutes to day two doing 17 minutes. Mm -hmm. And so just being able to engage him in something that's important and purposeful to him distracts him from what we're actually doing in standing longer. Um, because again, we're working on endurance, standing tolerance, balance, so many different things. And so that's kind of like, you know, so, you know, one of the uses that we look at is just that, you know, distraction, um, distraction into something that's fun. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I know, uh, Back, uh, you know, before the stroke, when I had the two functional hands, I was playing uh, a lot of uh, a lot of video games. Well, actually, I tended to play a lot of one video game. I'm, I was still working my way through Fallout 4. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's you start playing and you think, you know, 20 minutes has passed. And it turns out you've been playing for four hours and you just, you just right. totally lose track of time. You're falling into that time warp of getting really into this world and really into what it is that you're doing. Right. And, and you know, how cool, you know, and of course we have issues with our kids doing that. <laughs> what if you could harness that for a therapeutic gain, you know, and that's where I see it um, being super effective and, and, and fantastic. You know, what's interesting about the Xbox adaptive controller um, is that as we are making it, as we are kind of discussing uh, accessibility and helping people you um, being able to play games, um, for me, I started seeing this as a therapeutic opportunity. You know, whereas I know that a lot of the developers at Microsoft were like, we just want people to game. And for me, I was like, oh my gosh, I can use this as a, a therapy tool. You know, like I've been using the Wii, I've been using uh, DJ Hero on the Xbox or like the Kinect. I use all these different things. And, you know, so a lot of times when I see something new, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like I could use this therapeutically. I could potentially, you know, tap into something that hasn't been tapped into before. Um, and so it's kind of a really cool opportunity as, as it's being developed. And, and, and even for me, I, I knew that it was going to serve a smaller market as far as, 
you know, I think Xbox knew they weren't going to make a ton of money on this product, but um, that they were, it was almost a love letter to, you know, for inclusion, like saying, Hey, we want everybody to be able to game, you know? And for me, you know, I'm looking at it. Oh, man, that's awesome. And then on top of it, I think therapists are going to love this. I think therapists are going to want to buy them to use in their clinics for therapy. When the Wii came out, people bought Wiis just to use in the clinic for therapy. And so you can probably go to, like, you know, clinics all around the United States and uh, realize that 90% of them have Wiis in them. Of course, the <laughs> Wii came out in, like, 2006, and people are still using them. So I'm, I'm constantly telling people to... Uh, you know, get rid of the Wii and, you know, find some other new gaming to go with. Even though the Wii was great, you know, we're two, we're two um, consoles past that. And so, um, so I always think it's just funny that that kind of is what sticks in their head. And like, if it works, if it's not broke, don't fix it, I guess. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a very conservative field when it comes to bringing in uh, new gear. And uh, especially then trying to go through the hassle, I'm sure, of getting your, your hospital administration to go ahead and approve the per- purchase of video games. Oh, I know. That's always so funny. And, you know, I actually um, talk to people quite a bit about justifying gaming um, to be, you know, purchased out of a medical budget, you know. Mm-hmm. And usually the conversation will be, um, okay, well, you're not going to be able to um, you know, like you can either afford a uh, $10,000 piece of medical equipment or you can just, you know, do 200 bucks and, you know, call it good with a video game, you know. So, you know, right. who knows? Right. Well, what I, I think know. is really – I mean, they usually like the cheaper version. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that can, that can make, make a big difference. And I think what's, what's really interesting too – about the Xbox Adaptive Controller in particular, I think, well, probably, first of all, they've more than made up for their development costs in uh, PR and press that they've gotten off of oh, having absolutely. it and supporting their initiatives, especially combined with uh, their broader initiatives, including their uh, autism hiring initiative, including yeah. the, the things they're doing with Presentation Translator, which while you're doing a pa- – while you're conducting a PowerPoint uh, – presentation will actually produce live captions of you speaking for those who may have hearing challenges or those who may want to follow along with you in a different language or even things like Skype translator now, which even if you're on a Skype audio call, uh, it will actually provide live captioning in the language of your choice of the conversation, again, facilitating communication among folks with uh, different languages or who may have hearing or auditory processing challenges. Um, right. And that's incredible, too. You know, like the, to think that and, you know, we're at the infancy of, you know, of that, you know, like in 10 years, it's everybody's just going to assume that they can walk around with headphones and know what every single person says. You know, <laughs> it's going to be crazy. Exactly, exactly. And we're getting there. And and what I really think is interesting about the adaptive controller is that when you see pictures of it, or if you see it online, generally you see this uh, white rectangle with these two big black circles and a bunch of places you can plug in. The thing is, the adaptive controller itself is just a hub. You you don't actually just plug it in and start playing the game. You get to attach right. other things to it. And I think it becomes really interesting. I want to talk about some of those other things in a moment, but also how it pot- has the potential to also then be, be used beyond Xbox and be used as just an alternative interface for your computer or an alternative mouse or keyboard that can even go beyond beyond gaming and not only uh, absolutely. help. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of people um, don't know this, but it's it's compatible with PC. You know, you can use it on Windows 10. Um, and, you know, at Warfighter Engaged, um, and I'm sure we'll probably talk about um, this nonprofit that I work with uh, at some point. But, um, you know, that's one of the things we're exploring. We want to see how far we can actually push this. Um, and I know right now our founder, Ken, who's our, you know, uh, engineer that builds all, all of our buttons and switches and everything, you know, he's looking at the mouse and he's looking at the keyboard. We actually have some prototypes that we're pushing out right now to do just those things, you know, like, hey, I, I want to explore a complete world 
outside of gaming that we can make accessible for people um, easier. You know, all these things exist, you know, like adaptive keyboards and, you know, um, touch, you know, uh, you know, different things for people with um, speech impediments or, you know, uh, you know, or aphasia or, you know, uh, or have never been able to speak, you know, kids with CP or whatever. You know, these things exist, but they're expensive. Um, a lot of times they require services that are expensive and not as accessible as you'd want to be. Um then all of a sudden you make this stuff that is essentially you buy one thing and all of a sudden you a world open to you and the possibilities are very different and very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And what I think is also really interesting is sort of on that offshoot, what we've gen- what we've generally found is that accessible design is just generally good design. I mean, a lot of folks right. now who look around at, you know, at the change in doorknobs that happened very quietly and subtly is that you don't see doorknobs on new construction nearly as much as you see door handles. And a lot of right. people just don't know that those things came into being primarily to help folks who don't have the dexterity to manage or turning around doorknob. Right. And that's incredible. You know, I mean, we, we even talk about curb cuts. Curb cuts were never made to, you know, take a, 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 a rolling uh, suitcase up. It was always for a wheelchair user, you know, but now we use it for like bicycles. We use it for, you know, furniture, you know, luggage. We use it for all kinds of things. Um, and, you know, um, I think Xbox says sometimes uh, it's like unintentional you know, gains from an intentional um, thought or something like that. Mm. Anyway, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Like, cause when you design for one, it can benefit all, you know? And I think that's pretty fantastic when it turns out that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, you mentioned that, you know, we're really just at the infancy of all this stuff and we're starting to see a whole bunch of new things in, in, in worlds of virtual reality and, augmented reality and you know the microsoft hololens product in development i mean how do you see all of this sort of next level stuff impacting patient care and recovery yeah you know what's cool especially with like augmented reality and virtual reality i think there's a lot of implication for uh for therapy you know before you know we use a technique a lot of time in stroke that's called like we use them, uh, mirrors uh, quite often. So essentially, we would put a mirror between your affected arm and your non-affected arm. And as you're bringing your affected or your non-affected arm up, you have a mirror that you're looking at, thinking that your affected arm is kind of moving also. So it's it's a mirror. It's a technique that kind of helps stimulate the brain to think that you're moving the other one and essentially, you know, that neuroplasticity and kind of retraining the brain on what it's supposed to be doing, you know, but if you think about VR and augmented reality and all these other things, you know, we could essentially simulate these things, you know, using a pair of goggles or whatever. um, And almost like visualizing your own body doing what it's supposed to do kind of uh, through that stuff. And I mean, take that movie avatar. I mean, the movie avatar is essentially a VR movie, um, with a guy who's, um, you know, is a paraplegic. And now all of a sudden he's got this world that's open to him that he didn't have before. So, you know, so that's a, that's a, that's a cool place to be. And, you know, if you don't make a full recovery, if your stroke leaves you with a flaccid left side or right side or, you know, or leaves you with the ability, you know, you know, not to be able to engage in the things that you once did physically, you know, these VRs and ARs, might give you a world that you can now start exploring that is, you know, just it's different for you, but it's worthwhile and, and interesting. I mean, even that movie Ready Player One essentially has this fantastical world that is a plausible future that everybody just lives into this, it lives in this utopia that they can manipulate and be in where they're either physical body, maybe they're, they don't make a lot of money and so they live in poverty um but in the world they can be you know a rock star or something um and so you know and we've explored some of this stuff early on like those sims games it gives you like a different world you can be a different person you can make yourself look like whoever you want and engage with people that you know live around the world you know so you know a lot of times you know when we're looking at mental health things that's also something you can look at you know so um you know service members 
clients that are dealing with mental health issues, a lot of times they'll get on and say, well, I'm going to lose myself in this game because in this game I'm important, you know, and, and, and that's something, or I'm, or I'm even with my friends, I'm being able to socialize with my friends doing something that, you know, we used to do together or something. So, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I hit a lot of different things there, but you know, there's a lot of opportunity out there for kind of a virtual space. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much stuff happening there. Like I said, we had some early efforts in in worlds with uh, things like Second Life uh, back in the uh, yeah. back in the early aughts, and there's all sorts of interesting things happening. And I've been reading some more about uh, the role of online and virtual communities have had in helping folks dealing with gender identity issues to explore and figure out their true identity and and how that's yeah. going to shape up for them and. You know, when the idea of, you know, if in a virtual world, no one knows you've had a stroke if you don't want them to. Right. Yeah. I mean, you could just basically be, you, you know, and what's interesting, I've been consulting with a bunch of different game companies and, and I won't name them specifically, but developers who are looking at some of those things, like how do we build a game that is, that considers how you view yourself, somebody with injuries, you know, and how can we potentially portray that in a world? And if you look, like Xbox recently came out with new avatars that you can have prosthetics. You know, you can be in a wheelchair. You can have a track chair. I mean, you can be – you can either identify as your own self or you can, again, you know, be a full-bodied human um, and portray it that way. Um, but I think the cool thing about right now where we're – the cultural sensitivity of the world, though sometimes flawed – the place that's not flawed is the acceptance of people with disabilities, which I think is fantastic because people are way more accepting and they they empower more. Um, and even, you know, and this is the right time in the world to start exploring those things in gaming, you know? And so when you empower somebody who's got a disability, they sometimes want that disability. You know, like I tell people all the time, I've got scars all over my body but I would never give them up because it made me who I was. Um, I was just at a uh, conference at the U.S. Play Coalition in Clemson, South Carolina, and uh, these two young ladies who essentially both the girls were paraplegic and kind of if you talk to them about, like, do you wish that you could, you know, be this or be that or walk normally, they'll tell you, no, this is who I am. You know, like, I identify as a strong young woman who, you know, propels a wheelchair. And I think that you know, if you take that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, especially like before that, you know, it is, it's not great, you know, and people kind of shun you. Um, I think the U S is doing a really great job. I think a lot of the Western culture, um, in Europe, same thing, but you know, I recently took a trip to Morocco and I, I learned that, uh, in Morocco, if you have a kid with disabilities, you're shunned. The kid is not allowed to go to school. Um, and has to stay at home and the family is looked down upon because of it. And that's crazy to me. Like what a weird place to be, you know, in, in a world that we think is so accepting of people with disabilities. And I think most, uh, most adults right now try to teach their kids to, uh, to accept people with disabilities. So, you know, to, to be in Morocco in a country that was like, Oh, nope, they have a disability. They can't work. They can't do anything send them back to the house. We don't ever want to see them again. They can't contribute to society. That was tough. That was a really tough message. And and that's something that they're trying to change, you know? So, um, and kind of part of our reasons for going over there was to kind of help them problem solve some of these, um, issues that they're having, you know, being over there. So, right. Anyway. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I just got back from uh, a week in India and one of the things that was striking to me was that I did not observe anyone else with a visible disability out and about. Oh, right. Um, and, yeah. and just, just, just not there. Uh, you know, and I think there's so much cultural baggage tied into disability. I mean, even things like the word stroke, I mean, it's etymology is from hundreds yeah. of years ago where it was because you were struck by God as punishment for something. Really? I didn't know that yeah. that was, why it's called stroke yeah because it came on so suddenly that's you would, crazy it, and and yeah and that's that's just the vernacular now but i mean that's where that comes from 
wow. Okay, well, <laughs> we're both learning things today. Aren't absolutely, we? <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so it's it you know, but it is fascinating and it's amazing to be at a point where technology and culture in the United States and in other places is changing to make things these more acceptable and to give folks more options. So, what is Operation Supply Drop? So uh, we talked a little bit about Warfighter Engage, um, but yeah, let's transition to Operation Supply Drop. Now, this is a um, an organization that ha- you know I've been with for quite a while now, and you know, whereas Warfighter Engage looks at a lot of the physical disabilities, um, being able to get people to game again um, in the world of you know, um, accessibility and whatnot, Operation Supply Drop. We actually started out. Um, back in the early, like 2000, I want to say 2010, 2009, um, when our founder essentially saw that video games really provided a great window to decompress um, while you were overseas. Uh, while you were overseas, so like if troops were going out on long missions, they would come back, they would want to um, decompress, so they'd throw on some video games, Call of Duty, Halo, whatever. And he noticed that you know. It was great for the troops, so he decided to start this nonprofit that essentially would, you know, send video games to troops overseas. I mean, that's essentially that was it. You know, that was the the mission. Um, and a couple of years later, they decided they were they were growing um, exponentially. Hired a, um, a a business guy who knew a, a lot more about how to grow an organization and uh, uh, named Glenn B- Banton. He's our C- um, CEO. And he took the organization to a whole new level. Um, and it was just this like huge passion um, that he had to make things bigger and better. He knew that, uh, you know, eventually um, gaming though is a, a huge focus of ours that, you know, if we have troops, you know, if our, our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan start to um, quiet down and troops come back overseas, you know, we wanted to make sure that we are still relevant for, you know, people after the war, um, after those kind of moments, um, and how do we maintain that? So so now we have kind of a, a, a – we, we still do a lot of the same stuff. We still send, you know, uh, care packages or supply drops over to, tro- to troops overseas and, and whatnot. But we really started to focus on a lot of mental health stuff back here um, at home, and uh, we also work with our ANZAC NATO allies uh, overseas. Um but the focus is is a lot of mental health stuff. Um, it's it's making sure that we're building strong communities around the United States, um, that or around the world um, that can support each other. You know, and not just military, but you know the uh, communities that are military. Uh, that our veterans find themselves in. So not only are we, you know, trying to build up the veterans, we're building up the communities so that they can you know, properly support those veterans and, you know, deal with some of these mental health issues that a lot of our troops are, you know, experiencing, you know, getting out of the military or, um, you know, coming back from, you know, from these uh, conflicts that we have overseas. Um, you know, and we do a lot of different things. Um, you know, our primary, we have chapters um, all over uh, and we, when, you know, we're constantly building, looking at opportunities to, you know, you know, find places to grow, um, and, you know, technically, you know, essentially we want to just be the kind of most generationally relevant, um, nonprofit for veterans, uh, it's essentially thinking the, like the USO or, um, the VFW back in the day, we know that that's not necessarily where our current, uh, group of veterans are, you know, a lot of the veterans want to be at home and connect in a different way. And so we want to provide that opportunity um, either, you know, via, via gaming or, or, you know, different chapters in different places. And so, um, so it's kind of this love letter to guys and, you know, men and women that, that get out and don't have a place to be. Uh, we want to empower them, build them up, give them skills, teach them how to get jobs, you know, teach them how to uh, be productive in their communities um, and to support one another. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's really awesome how the idea of just starting with with gaming has evolved into this more comprehensive look at helping people live the lives they, they really want to live. I'm 42 and, you know, I've grown up with, you know, gaming. And so it's kind of part, part of my culture, my personal, you know, place in, in, in space. Um, but I think that as we 
start to transition this older generation that didn't have a lot of technology um, into this new generation that is only technology that, you know, as we get older, more and more people are going to want to be able to be connected via video games or whatever, you know, like video games is a great medium for anybody to connect. I mean, my dad and I, first 35, 40 years of my life, we probably played two games of chess, Hmm. you know, in the last two or three years, I've played 80 games of chess with him, you know, so Mm -hmm. like, and that's on my phone, you know, so, you know, it's a, it's an opportunity for people to connect in a way that they weren't able to before. Um, you know, and when I'm 70, 80 and my OT comes in and says, what kind of things are you into? I'm probably not going to say reading the newspaper. I'm probably going to say, <laughs> I like gaming, you know, give me a controller. Let me figure out how to, you know, take down fallout 17. <laughs> right. So, I mean, so then how does that compare to the work you do with warfighter engaged? It's cool that I'm with both of these organizations. Warfighter Engaged, um, actually, it's interesting because our the history with Warfighter Engaged is, you know, I was a um, OIC, the officer in charge of the amputee section of uh, at Walter Reed uh, for OT back in the early or you know, let's say. 2011, 2012, for a few years, you know, I started trying to get a lot of guys would come back with missing hands or digits or whatever. And one of the things that we would talk about quite a bit is trying to get them back to gaming. And they would be like, well, I guess I'm not going to game ever again. And of course, that was never an acceptable, you know, line in, in my head. And so I would build splints, I would make different things to enable to them to game. But, you know, my, my knowledge was kind of limited by being able to just create things with my hands out of plastic, or find different controllers to play with. Incom walks in our founder, Ken Jones, and Ken, he's like, well, why don't you just rewire that thing? You know, just put all the, you know, controls on that left side. And I was like, well, that's good in theory, but I have no idea how to do any of that. You know, so, you know, I told, so he's like, well, let me do it. You know, I'll, I'll do that for you. And then we started to build this relationship that essentially was, hey, you know, we'd do treatment sessions that were for gaming. If, you know, people lost limbs or people, you know, weren't able to, um, you know, engage in gaming, then we would figure out however they needed to do it, you know, and which was, which was really cool. And then all of a sudden, you know, next thing you know, Ken's like, Hey, I'm going to start this nonprofit warfighter engaged. And he asked me to be his chief medical officer. And I was like, absolutely. You know, I mean, this is a, a really cool opportunity to be able to empower, you know, our veterans, you know, current you know you know polytraumas or limb loss or stroke or whatever it is and then the future ones um and so from there you know we just started hey if you guys know somebody a veteran that can't play we want to you know enable them to play amputees to burn patients to stroke patients to brain injuries all kinds of stuff so you know we have microsoft kind of saw some of the work that we were doing and said hey you know we would love to collaborate with um you guys or figure out you know um, we'd love to chat with you or for you guys to come out to redmond chat with some of our developers on some of the stuff that you're doing accessibility what you're doing with veterans you know is there then we started the discussion for it'd be cool to have this like kind of all-inclusive box or some kind of place where we could just plug things in instead of because you know essentially we're rebuilding a controller every single time so whether it be um just rewiring one to one side sometimes we would have to um, do these big rigs for quad amputees who didn't have fingers at all and so we'd have these big over you know this big old buttons and big old you know um, you know uh, analog sticks and and whatnot Um, but every time we'd have to rebuild everything Uh, so we had this discussion like you know if we had this you know different type of hub or something where we could just plug into then we just really have to deal with buttons and switches and joysticks and stuff Um, and you know that was you know kind of the start of it all they discussed it in a hackathon there at microsoft um, and really that adaptive controller is the very first piece of hardware that has ever been produced coming from the hackathon that they do at microsoft there every year, um, which is really cool. You know, they had a lot of software stuff that came out, but to have a piece of hardware come out um, from kind of an idea that we were a part of uh, was pretty, pretty fantastic um, and, and really cool, you know, and I mean, we really obviously celebrated with everybody because, sure. you know, what a, what a cool achievement. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really exciting to see those innovations coming out and, you know, just more and more of these uh, opportunities and possibilities 
opening up to folks. Um, and, you know, I know there's all sorts of new stuff happening all the time. And, and you just got back from the, uh, the big OT conference for the year, the AOTA meeting. And uh, yeah. what are some of the biggest trends and news you saw coming out of that conference? It must have been an incredible experience. Oh, it was really cool. You know, what's, what's neat, you know, I've been saying this for years <laughs> to OTs because a lot of people would take my OT, my gaming OT, my tech OT stuff, you know, kind of with a grain of salt and like, oh, that's cute. That's cute. That's cute. <laughs> but what I kept telling them was like, this is going to be a thing that you really need to consider. You really need to pay attention to because it's going to be a big deal. Like you're, you won't be able to, um, you know, shy away from it. I mean, it can, even back to like when I was working with amputees, like one of the big issues that we had was that prosthetics couldn't operate a smartphone. Like if you were a double upper extremity mm. amputee, you couldn't touch a smartphone and, and operate it. You know, I, I remember like I would buy spools of silver thread and tie it around their arm and then lace it up into their prosthetic hand so they could kind of close that you know, that connection that lets you be able to touch your phone, you know, so like little things like that. So, you know, as we move into the future, I'm telling you, I told prosthetic companies, like, you're going to make a bazillion dollars once you figure out a prosthetic that can, you know, operate a smartphone. Um, but, um, but so back to conference, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there, we're in opening ceremonies and, and there's 10,000 OTs there. And the president of our national associations association starts talking about OT and our distinct value. And then all of a sudden she says, and you know what? Who knew that OT would be able to land in industry? Three OTs had worked with Xbox. To, and so she started talking about the controller. And she showed the video, the Super Bowl commercial, on the big screen in front of 10,000 therapists and how important it was for – you know, and it's not about the controller and the tech. It's about that I'm empowering a patient. It's about that I'm making big, huge strides with lives, you know, and I think people finally got it. Like, I get it. That's what Eric's talking about. It's not about tech and how cool it is. It's about empowerment, you know, engagement. Um, and so it was really cool to see that all of a sudden people started to really change. And, and I mean, I've been to these conferences speaking on tech for several years now, and this was the first year that it was really a huge deal. Um, matter of fact, early on, I, I, I contacted the conference and said, Hey, would you consider giving us a whole aisle at the expo that we could bring in these big time tech people and have our own little tech zone? And so we collaborated with several different nonprofits and, of course, Microsoft um, and a lot of people doing cool things in tech. Um, and they said, yeah, 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 let's do that. And so we had like eight booths of people doing all these really cool things for people with you know, disabilities. And so it really was a kind of a neat new trend. And it was the most traffic we've ever seen. I mean, like, I couldn't tell you, I couldn't even walk away from the booth because people just wanted to talk and talk and talk and show me that, show me that. Because you can see the adaptive controller on commercial, but to put your hands on and to see how easy and flawlessly it works is a whole nother story. So, um, so there's a huge trend of that. And, and, you know, the funny thing is I can't even talk about the rest of the conference because I was so busy, you know, <laughs> fielding all these questions about tech and showing the incredible stuff. I mean, right beside, our, uh, right beside us was an organization called Mightier. And Mightier um, creates um, – it's an app on your phone, but it creates games for kids that have um, issues with concentration or issues with aggression or, you know um, – you know, emotional regulation. And, and actually what happens is you wear a heart monitor and if you can't self-regulate, the, the game stops and it teaches you to breathe, relax. And once you can achieve that, then you can start playing the game again. Um, so that was kind of really cool to be able to see how people are harnessing tech to, to not only empower people, but to teach people how to be effective humans and how to effectively emotionally regulate regulate interesting interesting you know yeah. it's it's amazing how um we are seeing and we start tying this into some of the things we started to see with you know fitbit when it first came out of tracking right. people's steps and tracking people's sleep the the whole idea idea of the quantified human of giving us more data 
about what's actually happening in our bodies and what we're doing. And in this case, giving kids data about their heart rate. Once you have that data, once you have that information, it empowers you to start making the changes that you need to make, whether they're going to be subconscious or whether they're going to be conscious initiatives. Yeah. I mean, isn't that crazy? If I, I mean, and I talk about biofeedback all the time time and how important it is to, you know, empower people to understand what their body, how their body is reacting. Um, because if I told you, if I set you down and, and I did this early on in Afghanistan, I would have some people sit down and I would say, all right, I want you to work on, you know, deep breathing, meditation, relaxation, um, because it's going to make you a better you. And they're like, oh, that's garbage, whatever. But if I showed them their physical body was changing when they did it, then they could have something to grab onto. And I thought that was it's pretty cool and pretty important. Yeah, absolutely. It makes it it makes it less abstract. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, what do you wish I mean, you're very excited and into this OT field. You've been doing it for a while and it's really amazing, you know, what OTs are able to do and the the things that um, you know, my OTs help me with in the hospital and I, uh, you know, I'm, you know, very grateful for all of the work that, uh, that they've done. Um, what do you wish it was that more stroke survivors and caregivers knew about this OT field? You know, the thing that I tell people all the time, um, especially with new strokes, um, is I tell them, you know, explore yourself and who you are and what you want to be able to do. Um, my job is to empower you to do those things. But if I don't have that conversation with you, then I can't help you with those things. Um, you, know, you know, OT is trained to be able to be a very, it's a very holistic, you know, top to bottom. If you, if you got had a stroke and you're worried about sex, we should talk about that. If you don't know how to wipe your butt, we definitely should talk about that. You know, um, but a lot of people are so anxious about those conversations, even though they know they have to have them, you know, so, um, you know, so for, you know, a lot of people will talk to us all the time about, well, you know, it's physical therapy, physical therapy, physical therapy. And it's like, well, no, 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 I'm occupational therapy. And let me tell you why that's different. Um, and the difference is that because I'm trying to train you to be a new, a new you and, and how to do that effectively. Um, and so whether that be like, Hey, you know what? I'm a stroke survivor, but I can't play baseball again. Well, not necessarily. We might need to change it a bit, but let's talk about that. Um, let's explore these different options. Um, you know, physical therapy is going to look a lot at, you know, your gait patterns, your movement, your strength and all that. But OT is going to look at your personal, individual, independent life and how that has been redefined and, and, and what those lasting implications will be. And so I just really, you know, I encourage people that don't know what the profession is to look at it, but I also encourage people that are dealing with the profession to really push those therapists that are working with you. Like even just say, like, I heard you guys talk about sex and we're nervous about that. I mean, that's not a fun conversation. I mean, it might be a fun conversation, but it's an <laughs> uncomfortable conversation. You know, sure. and I've had a lot of patients that are very nervous about it. I mean, if you're a 30 something year old stroke, you don't think that that might be a concern. Like, could I even have sex if I wanted to, you know? So we kind of look at those things, you know? And so just be, you know, be, be empowered to be able to ask those questions. Um, you know, the therapist should talk to you about them but you know if they don't you know we deal with top to bottom the whole whole picture you know so and you're not going to shock or embarrass your ot by asking these questions no absolutely <laughs> not absolutely not um they they sh the the reaction should be delight thank you for <laughs> asking that because that's something that i can work with you on and you know maybe we don't always have the the, the answers but you know encourage your OT to go look for them. Like I, I look in textbooks all the time. I've been doing this for 15 years, you know, but I was like, I'm not hundred percent sure. Let me go check that out. You know, when I started working with strokes a couple few years ago, I was like, I have no idea what to do. You know, I didn't know I should, you know, try, try to only, you know, um, work on external rotation instead of internal rotation at first, because that's the one that it's harder to come back, you know? So, mm -hmm. you know, so things like that, I was just like, okay, you know, I've got to, you know, really relearn who I am and how I am and how I can be for my patient. Well, that is awesome, Eric. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this week. If folks want to know more about you and what you're up to, where should they go? 
Yeah, well, I mean, you can find me in a couple places. We've talked about Warfighter Engage and uh, Operation Supply Drop. You can, uh, Warfighter Engage, their website is just warfighterengage.org. And OS, um, Operation Supply Drop is wrosd.org. Org, um, and I have a personal website that all. If you want to kind of follow what I'm doing, um, have a lot of passions for life on there, and also some of the stuff that I do as an OT, um, learn more about those different treatment places. But my website is ericunleashed.com, um, and uh, that's E R I K because uh, I'm a little bit different, <laughs> uh, but ericunleashed.com. And then um, follow me on uh, all the social media, um, o- OT Unleashed. Um, that's on Twitter, on Instagram. Um, you guys can find me most places there. Um, love exploring the, in the, the resiliency of human. And so um, you'll find some pretty good stuff there. And we'll also have all of those links over at strokecast.com slash Eric. Awesome. So, so, Eric, this has been great. Uh, thanks so much for being on the show this week. Uh, I really appreciate it. And thanks for inviting me. And um, I appreciate you letting me to share some of my story and um, talk about my nonprofits. And, um, you know, we'd love to collaborate. If anybody's interested in more information, please do get a hold of me. Um, I, I love to work on research with people. I love to, you know, answer questions if people are concerned about something you know like i'll be your kind of free ot education uh, (laughs) via the internet so please don't hesitate to ask me questions and that brings us to our hack of the week we're always looking at you know different ways to do things but i and i always say you know keep things at at your level and whether that's you know if you're setting up your kitchen and you want to cook you know make sure you know you bring those instead of having your oven controls on the back you know, put your oven controls in the front so you don't reach over a hot stove to try to turn something off. Um, if you're in a chair or, you know, even if you're ambulating, but you're not as strong as you once were, the last thing you want to do is be working over a hot surface. And then all of a sudden now you have a burn and, you know, working with an injury, but, um, the kitchen's always, I'm very passionate about the kitchen. I always want to make sure that people have, um, the ability to engage in, um, whatever activity they need to do in there, like whether it be cooking, throwing something in the microwave. So having things at that level, having things like, you know, where your waist is um, and that you're not reaching down or up or anything. So like, um, you know, I always tell people just, you know, set everything up like very close to you, very, um, very accessible. Um, and, you know, honestly, like that's, that's a huge part of um, what I like to do is just education for that. And sometimes it's visiting their houses and kind of telling them very specifically what their kitchens should look like. We covered a lot of ground in this episode, but whether we're talking about OT as a field, the future of gaming, or Eric's personal story, it's ultimately all about helping survivors live the best life they can live. It's about helping folks simply do more of what it is they want to live for. And now I have an update on some previous guests. Uh, Last year, I interviewed Ann Daly and Mark French about their stroke documentary, A Teachable Moment. You can find those links over at strokecast.com slash Eric. The big news is that A Teachable Moment is now available for streaming in your home via Amazon Prime. If you are a Prime customer, check it out and share with your friends and family. Congratulations to Anne, Mark, and the entire A Teachable Moment family for this big step. So what's your experience with video games been like post-stroke or other disability? Let us know in the comments over at strokecast.com slash Eric. Check out ericunleashed.com or Eric's nonprofits by visiting strokecast.com slash Eric. Share this episode with an OT or a gamer in your life by giving them the link strokecast.com slash Eric. Check out A Teachable Moment on Amazon Prime. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you soon. The Strokecast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan 
or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The StrokeCast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network. Thank you.